Hello and welcome to this ENT session. And I am your ENT educator, Dr. Sanjay Agarwal. And I've been teaching ENT for 19 years now. And today I thought I'll come out with a very unusual topic. And it's important diseases of the pinna. Now you know that on pinna, uh, in our usual lectures, we don't talk too much. Very few diseases, just mention maybe briefly one or two lines. But I thought that today I'll show you the images especially of all the important conditions on the pinna. Because pinna, as you see, has a highly, very high cosmetic value right on your face in front. And we take so much care of our pinnas and decorate it the way you see on these images. And if there is some disease or problem on the pinna, then it really cause, bothers us. Physically, it's a pain, sometimes fever and all that, but also psychologically, mentally, because as I said, pinna carries a very high cosmetic value. So if it gets distorted, things like that, then we have a problem. Now, I'm not talking about in this particular session, I'm not going to talk about the congenital defects on the pinna, like microtia, anotia, and fistulas and all that, because we, I've done a session on that congenital disease of the ear together. I've done one session on that. So everything got covered. All the important congenital disease is there. Here I'm talking about only the pathological conditions which are non-congenital in nature on the pinna. Few are very, very important conditions. Few not so important, not so common, but important. They, all of them are important. So let us start with a very simple condition, perichondritis of the pinna. Now from the name you understand, it's an inflammation of the perichondrium of the pinna. <clears throat> and we all know that pinna is predominantly cartilage, most of it, except the lobule, maybe incisura terminalis. Rest of it is cartilage. And the outermost layer of, of the cartilage is perichondrium. And that gets inflamed perichondritis. Now, the most common con cause of perichondritis is pseudomonas. Now, this is important. You know why? It's also an MCQ because perichondritis can happen anywhere in the body. Cartilages are everywhere in the body and everywhere where you have cartilage will have perichondrium. When they get inflamed, it's perichondritis. But the thing is that perichondritis of rest of the body is caused by staph aureus. So if they ask you just one question, line question, that which is the most common pathogen causing perichondritis? The answer is staph aureus. But if they ask you perichondritis of the pinna specifically, then it is pseudomonas. Very, very important. And pseudomonas, we all know in most cases, is an opportunist, opportunistic pathogen. So if the patient has some drop in the immunity, either in the form of uh, diabetes, patient is on steroids, whatever, then it tends to be more common. Now, very typically, this condition presents as pain, fever, redness, edema, and tenderness. And if you look at the image, you can see the redness especially and mild edema maybe you can make out. And very interesting is that this redness is seen only in the part of the pinna which has the cartilage. We all know that this, this is lobule. Lobule does not have the cartilage, isn't it? And see, you don't have perichondritis or redness there. That means if there's no cartilage, there's no perichondrium, it cannot have a perichondritis or redness in this area. This area is spared in a way. And rest of the pinna is almost everything redness. So this is a very typical and a very important finding that can help us diagnose this condition very, very easily. Right. And because it's an uh, infective disease, the treatment is uh, antibiotics mainly, plus symptomatic for pain and fever, of course. You have to give medicines. And if the patient is diabetic or has immunocompromised status, we have to treat that also along with this. Not a very uh, difficult to treat, uh, condition to treat because infective diseases are not very difficult to treat. And it's a uh, relatively common condition compared to other pinna disease. Overall, it's not common. Otherwise, but compared to other pinna diseases, this one is relatively common condition. And that's why you should be able to diagnose uh, from the exam point of view at least, image based question is a possibility. So they will just give you a spot diagnosis and 
how do you differentiate its perichondritis from say dermatitis if somebody says this could be a dermatitis what do you say if it is dermatitis of the pinna area then this area will also be congested because dermatitis does not spare does not affect it doesn't matter to dermatitis whether it's cartilage or this area of the lobule has fat actually so dermatitis will have a widespread inflammation but because it's perichondritis is confined to the area which is cartilages only so that will give you the lead very easy and very interesting actually now another condition we're going to talk about is relapsing peri polychondritis and the name tells you polychondritis it is not specifically ear disease it is a disease which affects many cartilages at the same time and it comes back again and again relapsing so repeated attacks so it's a multi-systemic disease as you can see repeated episode as i said because the name relapsing tells us of inflammation of multiple cartilages that's what i told you multiple cartilages are inflamed at the same time often it is painful disease because cartilages are present in the joints so joint deformities and could be life threatening if you know the cartilage of the chest and all are involved then it could be in the heart lungs and all that then it could be life threatening so it's a very very dangerous disease at some times now it's an immune mediated defect and most of the immune mediated defects are very difficult to uh, treat but here the immune system attacks the proteins of the cartilages and that's how you have very polychondritis now from the ENT point of view this condition very commonly affects two cartilages one is pinna cartilage that we are talking about and nose cartilage pinna and nose and sometimes it can affect the larynx also so pinna nose and larynx because larynx is predominantly cartilage now larynx uh, because uh, it's not easy to diagnose laryngeal cartilage involvement so that's why usually you don't get a very good image of it but pinna and nose you can see that uh, the this time the almost the entire pinna is involved and rest of the area surrounding areas you see it's suddenly the inflammation ends because just outside the pinna there is no cartilage there so there can be cannot be chondritis there so similar to the perichondritis that we discussed this is polychondritis chondritis of the pinna and the area involved are the same area <clears throat> right in that case perichondema is involved this is the cartilage itself is involved cartilage is involved because auto uh, auto uh, immune mediated attacks on the proteins of the cartilage <clears throat> and pin and nose if you divide the nose front of the nose into upper one third is bony lower two third is cartilage lower two third so the entire cartilage the two cartilages mainly the upper lateral cartilage and the lower alar cartilage in this particular image that you see the lower alar cartilage is involved but it involves the upper lateral cartilage or both of them at the same time right now because it is immune mediated condition uh, we have to treat with steroids mainly we all know in on or you can give immune suppressants but both steroids and immune suppressants if they are given for a long duration of time they have a lot of these own implications a lot of complications can happen and therefore you have to be careful about this but even if you treat once with steroids and or immune suppressants then once you stop the drug it tends to come back again and that's the uh, bad serious part of it moreover because it can involve the cartilages of the vital structures like heart and lungs it can be life threatening at times so one has to be very very careful about this disease so it's a multi systemic disease relapsing polychondritis because ENT has a lot of cartilages in the ear in the pinna in the nose in the larynx, larynx it becomes very important from the ENT point of view right then seroma of the pinna seroma comes from the word serous fluid so it's a water like fluid collection forming a cyst between the perichondium and the cartilage so it is asymptomatic usually cystic swelling or the pinna that results from accumulation of sterile fluid serous fluid is sterile fluid in the unlined intercartilaginous space so within the cartilage space there is so it is between the cartilage and the perichondrium it's mainly there unilateral asymptomatic as we said cystic on the helix and antihelix these are the most common site helix and antihelix and scaphoid fossa between the helix and the anti-helix anti that area is called 
scaphoid fossa. So when we draw the pinna like this, let's say this is the pinna, this is the helix, and this is the anti helix. And between the two, this area is the scaphoid fossa. So it's most commonly there, and sometimes here also in the area, Simba conca. So I'll show you. See, the first one is typically at the uh, scaphoid fossa. This area where you see the uh, seroma in the first image is the area of the scaphoid fossa between the helix and the anti helix. And the second one you can see at the Simba conca. It's direct diagnosis. Another image I'll show you. Look at this again, it's scaphoid fossa. It, this one looks very, very cystic, isn't it? Now, again, this is autoimmune usually. Immune mediated, and therefore the same problem treatment is difficult. A we give steroids, and we have to aspirate the fluid and apply tight bandage. This is what we do. We give steroid, aspirate the fluid, and apply tight bandage on the pinna. <coughs> steroid, of course, because it is autoimmune disease. And you can see in this image that this is how we aspirate the fluid, the sterile fluid or serous fluid from the seroma. But how do you apply a tight bandage on the pinna? That's my concern. And this tight bandage has to be there for two, three weeks. Can you imagine or guess how do you apply a tight bandage on the pinna? Pinna has so many ups and downs. It's not a smooth structure. So that will, even if you put a, you know, bandage around it, you cannot apply pressure in the scaphoid fossa with the bandage because above the scaphoid fossa is the helix, below is the anti-helix. So these two are not going to allow the pressure, sufficient pressure at the scaphoid fossa area. And you can't tie a bandage all around the you know face, circular, vertically or horizontally. That's not practical because I've told you this uh, bandage is going to remain two, three weeks. So how do you apply? Tied bandage. Now the two methods, one is called buttoning. One method is called buttoning. And the other you can be called quilting. These are very interesting methods, both of them, especially the first one, where we actually use the buttons. As you can see, that we take two buttons after aspirating of course one on the lateral side of that area and one on the medially and we pass suture between the two and then tie them and both these buttons are tied tightly and they will apply pressure the pressure will be constant in that area so you look at the second image you can see that in the first image you can see the suture is being tied the, you can only see one button but there is another button on the other side if you don't have button on the both the sides then this suture will cut through the skin and the cartilage you know if you apply too tight suture then it will cut through that's why you have to have button to prevent that cutting through the skin and the cartilage <clears throat> so that's why you have to have button on both the sides and in the second image you see that button has been applied already the tight and all that so many sutures because a lot of pressure has to be there otherwise it will be not will not be effective recollection will happen so this idea of this tight bandage with buttoning or quilting is to prevent recollection of the fluid because autoimmune disease they tend to uh, remain or come back again very easily that's why now this is a better method the second method i told you is quilting quilt we all know the one that we use for winters razai the old type of quilt where you used to have cotton inside and if you have not if you've seen quilt most of you must have that to keep the uh, cotton in place so that the cotton do not accumulate in one place we pile multiple sutures throughout the quilt multiple sutures are passed throughout the quilt isn't it that's called quilting so same thing is done here so multiple sutures is passed through the pinna across the pinna and then tied tightly so that these sutures will keep this skin tightly held against the cartilage and not allow the collection of the fluid or recollection of the fluid but as i said that's not as good a method as this one because if you tie the sutures too tightly then there is always a possibility of cutting through the skin and the cartilage. A, that may render the whole process uh, uh, ineffective. B, it can cause its own problem. 
So this is the best method, buttoning. So you keep the button for two to three weeks and once you think your job is done, you can cut the suture and remove the uh, buttons. So that's it. And uh, seroma is a pretty common condition compar comparatively, again, to other pinna conditions. Now we come to one of the most important conditions of the pinna and this is also a most important question from pinna from the exam point of view. Hematoma on the pinna. <clears throat> As the name tells you, this auricular hematoma and it's a collection of blood underneath the perichondrium and it's usually secondary to the trauma. Obviously, hematoma happens usually due to the trauma and this is mainly seen in people who are in contact sports where they get hit against each other like very common in boxers and because of it being seen in boxer it's also called boxer ear very common term boxer ear what is boxer ear hematoma on the pinna wrestlers rugby player football player you know where there is a contact sports it is also called cauliflower ear this is a question they ask you in the exam what is cauliflower ear it is hematoma on the pinna. So initially there is just uh, acute collection of blood and because these people are in this profession, so they get, they get hit again and again and again and again. So this collection becomes chronic problem and now it's called hematoma on the pinna. And the swelling on the pinna resembles very much like a clover, uh, cauliflower, that fruit and therefore the condition is called the cauliflower ear. Now, look at these images, different kind of uh, cauliflower ear or hematoma on different person in different persons so it, it's not obviously it's not going to be the same everywhere and this is otherwise asymptomatic there is no symptom no pain no fever no tenin, nothing it's only a cosmetic problem and because these guys usually these people they are rough and tough people they are into contact sports obviously you have to be rough and tough they're not sensitive people so most of them they don't bother about it anyways and they are so famous because of the sports that these simple things do not bother them. So most of them ignore, even otherwise, you can't do much about it. It's a cosmetic problem and you, the only thing you can do is cosmetic surgery. It's not, cannot be treated with medicine. So you have to do cosmetic surgery and then surgery can leave scars on the pinna, which in turn is a second problem. So it's best to leave it alone, unless of course the patient, uh, the person is cosmetically very sensitive he wants to have a perfect looking pinna but in the initial stage when this problem begins just when there is a the hematoma has not solidified it's just liquid at that point in time the patient comes to you then of course you can drain it either aspirate it or drain it and apply tight bandage and you can ask the patient to avoid contact and and tell them that every time there is a contact and you feel there is a swelling you come to me every time and so if you keep on aspirating or draining the uh, blood every time there is a contact and that collection then this kind of condition may not happen but usually these people <clears throat> they avoid visiting the doctor they don't bother about this condition and it forms a well-formed hematoma called cauliflower ear so very common from the exam point of view especially the names cauliflower ear boxes ear and hematoma on the pinna same thing that's all they ask you about in the exam then we talk about a very rare condition called chondrodermatitis nodularis chronic helices. So it's a chronic disease of the helix and the anti-helix helices. And chondrodermatitis, chondro is uh, cartilage, dermatitis is skin. So the skin and the cartilage, there is a nodular swelling. There is a nodular swelling on the skin and the cartilage of the pinna, which is chronic in nature, and the site is helix and anti-helix. It's a common benign condition of course painful this is the main reason why the patient comes to you it's painful and helix or anti helix of the ear i told you and often affects middle aged male usually sometimes older males and the most common cause is prolonged and excessive pressure in that area so how do you think the patient has a prolonged and excessive pressure on the pinna in the same area of the pinna usually it is due to sleep position so when we sleep on the lateral position sideways, the pinna comes in contact with either pillow or the bed and your head and the pillow are pushing against each other or bed and the head is pushing 
each other your pinna is bearing all the weight of your head and because we sleep for many hours if the patient keeps lying in that position for many hours and every day every day every day then this problem arises this is the most common cause of this condition called chondrodermatitis uh, nodularis chronic helices uh, prolonged and excessive pressure while we are sleeping and usually it's very small you can see this sometimes you can't even notice why it comes to the notice is because of pain this is a recurrent nagging kind of pain not recurrent it's constant there is a constant nagging kind of pain in that area and patient when he feels can feel some small nodular swelling and this pain is more troublesome while sleeping because the patient is used to sleeping in that particular position so every time the patient goes to this to sleep in the same position again there is a pressure and the pain starts so the sleep gets disturbed and patient may change the position but this happens to the patient who are used to sleeping in that particular position so they, once they de-sleep automatically by default the body comes back to the same position you know and again the patient may wake up with the sleep so it can disturb patient sleep a lot of time so this is this particular image diagram is showing you a small nodule but in severe cases or more profound case you can see that here it breaks to the skin and there is a kind of ulcer on the skin that's why chondrodermatitis the term was used and this kind of conditions then the there is a steno, there is a fibrosis here and the fibrous tissue con retracts contracts rather and then it can cause this kind of deformity on the pinna some kind of deformity on the pinna can happen and i told you since pinna has a very high cosmetic value any deformity of the pinna is not a good thing patient are bother about these things right now uh, treatment what do you do avoid pressure is the best thing this is the best thing you can do avoid pressure on that area and in the initial stages it will revert or reverse back to the normal thing and it may sound easy but it's not that easy because as i said it's seen in people who are used to sleeping in that particular position and the pressure is in the similar area or same area constantly for long duration of time and when you ask the patient to change how do you avoid the pressure by changing the position of the sleep isn't it and the patient may not be comfortable with that sometimes you know they are used to and if they try to change the position then they sleep gets deprived they keep waking up again and again and that can cause other kind of problems so one of the things that we do is we have special pillows pillows either above the pinna or only below the pinna so that pinna does not come in contact with the pillow or the bed surface so there is no pressure and sometimes even that patient is not comfortable so we have small sponge kind of bandage we apply around the pinna that bandage around the pinna so that bandage will avoid or not allow the pinna to come in contact with the surface of the pillow or the bed and so there is no pressure so that's other thing but once a well formed nodule is there then we have to we may have to do surgical excision of that nodule we have to do surgery and remove the nodule at times that is required and this kind of patient where the skin is breached then the skin is a protective layer the protection is gone and the cartilage is now exposed so chances of infection is very high if the cartilage gets infected it's not a good thing it's a very bad outcome so in all you have to take all precautions to avoid the infection of the cartilage and that's why in this patient you have to apply bandage clean regularly and maybe give antibiotics also so that there is no infection of the cartilage at least till it heals but it's not easy to heal it may remain that way so this is chondrodermatitis nodularis chronic helices then we talk about another condition called split lobule as the name tells you the lobule has a split a cut and it's usually due to heavy rings that the people wear so the heavy ring there is a dangling and it cuts to the lobule split lobule this is split lobule as you can see so once again it's a cosmetic problem and now this patient also cannot wear the earrings especially in females it can be a problem so it's a very simple surgery that you have to just stitch it up you have to remove the skin from this area this area skin has to be removed so that the area becomes raw and then stitch it up in three layers both side skin lateral and medial and in between center you have to remove the soft tissue of the center like 
whatever is there. Usually it is fat. So it is stitch it up. And this is the image you can see after the lobule, spit lobule has been corrected, stitched up. This is how it looks after the surgery is being done. And <coughs> once you uh, stitch it up, after a week or so you remove the suture and then you have to create another puncture for because most probably this is a lady and she wants to wear earrings in some uh, countries some uh, their customs that they have to wear earrings so they have to get repunctured for earrings so you never do a repuncture on the same site so you have to go either here or here whatever you know you have to be a little di distance from the area of the split lobule you never do the puncture repuncture on the same side if you do the puncture on the same side again it will split up so that's the fear <clears throat> so this is a precaution that we have to take then we have this disease called keloids in the ear <coughs> keloids can happen anywhere in the body also in the ear they are firm rubbery fibrous nodule firm rubbery fibrous nodule and usually due to minor trauma and how do you get trauma on the pinna? Again, those piercing, piercing for rings. And some people have multiple rings. So if you are piercing on the lobule area, then the chances of keloid formation is less. But if the cartilage gets involved, then the chances of keloid formation is very, very high. And it can happen anywhere in the pinna. You see, these are both, you can see both of them are in the cartilage part of the pinna, not in the uh, <coughs> lobule part of the pinna where there is no cartilage but it can happen in the lobule area also from the cartilage it can spread onto the lobule area also and have this kind of a problem so again it's a cosmetic problem it is asymptomatic usually yes while sleeping because sometimes the size is too big as you can see then it gets compressed and cause discomfort but really there is no uh, clear cut problem like pain constant pain and all that is not there it's more of a cosmetic problem and again you have to do a surgical excision of the keloid and when you do a surgery you are cutting the keloid and surgery is the trauma itself surgery itself is a trauma so when you cut the keloid remove it that area is traumatized and again a regrowth of the keloid may take place so what we do is to avoid regrowth before we do a surgery we inject steroids in at the root of this before many times few episodes a uh, few sittings of steroid injections and then we excise and after excision we repair the area very nicely and still we inject steroids in this area to avoid the recurrence of the condition but despite all this uh, recurrence rate is very very high in this case and it can be bilateral both sides so that's even more problematic and happens to young females cosmetically it is devastating psychologically so these are some of the important conditions of the pinna that i thought i would share with you as you have realized that most of the diseases we don't discuss in our regular lectures and that was my aim that I tell you and most of the images can be image based question that's why so with this I'll take a leave I hope this uh, session was useful for you and keep watching for other similar sessions I keep coming up on this platform thank you for attending and best of luck for future God bless you